If you watch my recent video on my Canon AE-1 program, you'll know that I now have a camera capable of taking pictures to 35mm film. But one thing I wanted to have, without having to pay a pretty penny for, is digital copies of the photos. Because the local lab I take my rolls of film to to have developed, well, they're not exactly cheap. In fact, just to get two rolls of 24 exposure film cost me around $40. And that was just to have a single set of the photos printed out, with the negatives being returned to me, of course, but that wasn't including any kind of scanning services. Now, don't get me wrong, the printed copies of my pictures are probably going to outlive the digital media I'm storing it to, but it's still nice to be able to take your photos and store them digitally as well. This unassuming box looks like it's right out of the 1990s computer scene. And that's because it is. This is the Nikon LS2000 film scanner from 1998 alternatively referred to as the Nikon Super Cool Scan 2000 these weren't cheap when new the LS2000 fetched around $2000 and you might have noticed that on the side uh, lower right corner of the door there's actually a sticker here that makes mention of something called digital ice and this was actually a much coveted technology that Nikon employed that used infrared light to remove the majority of scratches and dust though it does have the side effect of reducing the sharpness of your scans slightly so you do have to use some discretion Nikon actually gave you two different choices for installing this be it on its side or vertically and that's not so much to do with space constraints or personal preference but rather what sort of adapters you're going to be using with this there was an adapter for use with this a slide feeder for mounted 35 millimeter film which the only way you could use it is if the scanner was mounted on its side like this so that's why they gave you those rubber feet so this thing wasn't sliding all over the desk there are several different adapters you could use depending on your application and needs. What I ended up getting, which is uh, perfect because these are the two adapters that I plan to use the most and really are the only ones I need, is this SA20 strip film adapter. This is a motorized adapter allow you to insert strips of negatives that have been processed by the film lab. It is a motorized adapter, so when you install the film it will insert automatically you don't have to sit there and feed it in by hand and once the scanner has completed uh, all scanning routines it'll go ahead and eject those strips of negatives and that's actually why they give you this little tiny plastic tray that hooks into the bottom of the adapter that's just to hold your negatives in place and I always wondered until I read the manual what the purpose of this little groove cutout notch was well that's actually to show you whether or not the film is capable of being inserted in here so if your film happens to be for whatever reason wider than this little cutout in this tray you won't be able to use this adapter the second adapter I have for this is the MA-20 slide mount adapter and with that I also have the corresponding FH2 strip film holder it's my understanding that this adapter will essentially do the same thing as the SA-20 albeit in a fully manual fashion because you need to load your strips of film in here then you would close this up and you would slide it over which two pictures on that strip you want to scan in you'd have to insert it one way scan it in take it out reinsert it and scan the other one and that could very well take a great deal of time if you have a lot of pictures to scan in you might notice that the SA20 actually has a connector on its backside whereas the MA20 does not and that is for power and uh, likely responsible for commanding how much to either feed the film in or eject it depending on which picture you want to scan Aside from retrieving lost film, another reason you might want to take some time and remove that screw to open up this cover is to clean the little felt pads that are in here to catch dust and debris and remove them from the negatives. You have one over here which you might notice is quite a bit cleaner than the one that's over on this side. This is the uh, first line of defense for uh, getting rid of a lot of dust and debris and preventing it from getting scanned in with your pictures but you can see just how dirty this one is compared to the second one and so it's very 
Uh, it's a good practice to get in here every now and again, and it's even recommended in the manual before you f scan something of the utmost importance to go ahead and clean those little felt pads. Then once you're done with that, just go ahead and close it up and tighten the screw down. Coming over to the second most important side, the back side. This is old enough to use SCSI cables and a SCSI card. That's right, this communicates with your PC through SCSI. These are actually what's called half-pitch D-sub 50-pin SCSI connectors. I actually had quite a bit of uh, time finding a cable for a decent price on the used market. And there's two connectors here on the back of the Nikon scanner because, of course, one of the uh, claims to fame of SCSI is the ability to daisy-chain devices. So this could be the first, middle, or last in the line of daisy chain devices. And because of that, there's a terminator switch, if this is the last in the daisy chain, as well as a SCSI ID selector switch, which is preset from the factory to two. There's actually a way to use these thumb screws to hold the mechanism in place inside for safekeeping and safe travels without the thing moving around and banging around loosely if you're going to be somewhere where this is going to be getting jostled around and once this is permanently installed you just take those screws and install them here on the back panel for next time. Would it be that bad of an idea to dust this out? I'm not sure how well the camcorder can pick it up but it is dusty in there. Despite these Nikon scanners holding quite a bit of resale value in their increasingly old age the reason I was able to get this one for such an agreeable price was because it didn't work. There's quite a bit of documentation that has surfaced over the years on the maintenance and service of these older film scanners. In fact, this is the original guide that I had a reference and I didn't tear mine down quite to the level that this gentleman has in this tutorial. Well, instead of flipping through some pages, let's go ahead and tear into the scanner. I'm certainly no expert when it comes to the maintenance and service of these. I just kind of skimmed through the various guides that I found online because I kind of was uh, getting a bit ahead of myself and wanted to see if this thing actually even worked before investing too much time into it. Fortunately, I didn't have to get too involved with uh, cleaning and maintaining this thing, although many of these are much worse off than my example. And as such, they need quite a bit of care and TLC to get them back up and working. There are these metal rails on this side and on this side. And all I had to do is clean them using isopropyl alcohol, followed up by some liberal, well-placed applications of this PTFE-based lubricant. I also had to very gingerly use a screwdriver to loosen up the stuck stepper motor here on the front side. And what with this thing sitting on its backside and with this pointing up to the sky, I just put a couple little drops of lubricant on here as well and power cycled this a few times and it actually returned to life and started working again. And that was all that was necessary to bring this thing back into the land of the living, fortunately. Now, when we press the power switch, it'll actually spring to life. So all that's necessary now is to lower that door and insert the adapter, in which case, and in this case, is going to be the Nikon SA20, because that's what I use all the time now for scanning in film. Just install it like that. Probably should have this turned off before you do that. Yep, because I just heard the uh, motor adjust itself. I'm trying to get a SCSI card to work properly and play nicely with Windows 10 wasn't an easy task. The card I have in my computer is an Adaptec AHA-2940AU PCI SCSI card. Going off of Adaptec's website, the newest drivers that they have available is Windows Vista 32-bit. Nothing in here mentioned about Windows 7 or later releases, as is to be expected. But fortunately, this guy, Dave and Steve's blog, has an article talking about using drivers that were actually modified you have to disable driver signing in windows but you could see that there's an unsigned driver for the nha 29xx cards which is what i have 
and they this guy actually had it tested with a 2940U card under Windows 10 64-bit so you have to download that driver and then go through uh, jump through a couple of hoops to disable driver signing and then restart the computer and force install the driver you will get a couple of warnings but I was able to do that unfortunately once we come over to the software side that's where things get a bit more challenging Nikon actually provided software for use with this scanner called Nikon Scan, but the most recent version of that software I believe tops out at working with Windows XP, maybe even Windows 2000, and there's absolutely no way that I'm going to be able to get it to run under Windows 10. So the next best thing is to use this piece of software that I discovered called ViewScan, which actually comes with a plethora of drivers to use with these older scanners. After a couple of false starts later, I was able to get ViewScan to recognize that the LS2000 is powered up and connected to the computer. It's always done this where it never gets it on the first go-around that I have to power cycle the scanner several times. I don't think it's actually a problem with the scanner, more so just the drivers and having everything kind of shoehorned into running under Windows 10. Kind of introduces a bunch of different points and uh, roadblocks that you have to overcome. Now it's time for the fun part, scanning in the film. Just go ahead and uh, feed it in, trying not to touch it like a vinyl record. And it's going to go ahead and feed the film all the way in. This software has a lot of features in it, such as batch scanning, so it'll scan all the photos automatically if you have it configured appropriately. I have the resolution set to 2700 dpi. I've set it to autofocus always for both preview images and scans. And then I have it set to auto scan. And this setting basically means that the minute you put the film in the scanner attachment, it'll go through and it'll do a very crude and low quality scan of each image, each frame. So that way now you get a preview and you have something to work off of and you know which image corresponds with which frame number. There's a bunch of different settings in here that I'm not about to get into because I'm not an expert on this software. I have some settings here to crop the image down a little bit so we can remove a lot of the excess um, fat, if you will, of the scanned image where there is no image but just a bunch of uh, extra stuff that we don't need. And this is where this software really comes in handy because even though it's not Nikon's own, it allows us to employ the use of the infrared cleaning that we can uh, utilize because this has Nikon's ICE technology. And there's a couple different presets like light, medium, and heavy. I've had good luck leaving it on medium. If I turn that off, you can see on this image just how many scratches and how much dirt there is. And these scratches are because of the uh, company that I dropped the film off at. Their, te their uh, equipment isn't in the best of shape and I won't be using them going forward. But it scratched the hell out of a lot of my negatives. But when I turn that up, even to the heaviest setting, you could see how much better that image looks and cleaner. So that is uh, very important to be able to use that because if it weren't for Microsoft or rather Nikon ICE, we would have images that look like that. Like a stereotypical forgotten photograph found in the attic, which might be the look you're going for, but in my case, I want something that looks a bit more polished, clean, and presentable like this. It's like magic. One thing I would like to know and ask of those watching this video is what is a good all-around setting for cropping the images? Because if I just leave the cropping at 0%, there's going to be a lot of excess stuff on the image that I don't wish to keep, like the fringe areas of the film. See, here's an example of the cropping. It just wasn't enough for the top, and you could see some garbage up top. And that could be cropped later in post during editing of the images. But I'd like to have an image that is mostly picture perfect. Uh, no pun intended, at least for printing, without any additional cropping needing to be done. So I currently have it set to the crop size of 35 millimeter film and the border setting to negative 1.6. That seems to be a, a pretty good compromise. You're not cutting off too much of the usable image, but it's enough to get rid of the borders where there is no image that you want to save. But every now and again, like in that last image we looked at, there's still some garbage on the upper edge. So I need to fine tune that that or just increase the crop setting. So if anybody has any suggestions for cropping the images similar to what you would end up with or the results you would end up with if you had somebody else scan them like a film lab, they wouldn't usually give you images with all that junk on the edges. 
Which settings should I use? You tell me down in the comments. Yep, see, there we go. There's another one right there with that white strip. And if my math is right, that resolution, although subject to change depending on the cropping setting that I'm using, equates to just over 8.5 megapixels, which is pretty impressive for Sienna from 1998. It's really nice being able to sit back, relax, and let the scanner do its thing without me having to scan each individual frame in by hand and with full intervention. I could pretty much just sit here, feed it in once, let it generate the previews, then click the scan button, and that's it. If I wanted to cut out that extra step of me having to intervene on the computer, I could just set the software up to automatically begin scanning the minute film is inserted into the adapter, and it would go through the entire routine, scan all the pictures, and when it's done, it would do what it's doing right now, and eject the film, and I could move on with my next set of negatives. So this scanner, and doing things my way, that is doing it on my own, and scanning in the images on my own, probably isn't going to be everybody's cup of tea. Most people would be willing just to fork over the extra cash and have the film lab take care of scanning in the images. Scanning in your own film is a great way to lower the damage to your wallet when it comes time to develop your pictures and use them going forward digitally if you so desire or just to archive them even. In fact my video review of the Canon AE-1 program had a number of pictures, actually all the pictures in that video review that were taken with that camera were scanned in using my Nikon LS2000. I bet Nikon never predicted that somebody, aka me, would be using one of these old relics 25 years give or take later.